Uh, I'm going to start. Uh, let me introduce my assistant, Loida. Um, thank you for coming and, and helping me. Loida will, will be prepping everything. I, uh, I uh, use my, uh, I use my cooking skills to both relax, to be in touch with my past and who I am. To me, I have always, I've always had my mother's kitchen as my culinary. And uh, when I cook and when I eat Texas indigenous food, I'm connected to all of my past, not just my mom. So what I'd like to do first is just introduce some of the ideas that we will be talking about. I know that, we're, I know that you probably have seen the camote. This is a sunflower root, and it's very flavorful, it's delicious. They call it Jerusalem artichoke, porque nosotros le decíamos girasol, girasol, and, so, and it tastes like an artichoke. So someone in English just thought, well, girasol, Jerusalem, it's a Jerusalem artichoke has nothing to do with, with Jerusalem. Uh, is it possible to dim some of these lights and keep them open? Yeah. Uh, what we're going to do is talk about the Native American roots of Texas, Mexico. If you have a chance to see the New York Times, this was a couple of years ago, the front page story of the food section of the New York uh, talked about this food. And the title of it is Don't Call It Texas. And that's another, no? Try it. Turn it off. No? So when I cook, this summit invited me, and I thought, it's great because when I do flavors, we're really doing, thank you. Can you still see me? If I start cooking and you can see me properly, I will we'll turn them on, and then when I go to this, we'll dim them. Uh, cooking is about memory. Because we have to remember, like today I want to reclaim Jerusalem artichoke. I want to reclaim our land as the source of chiles. And it has to do with our identity. When we cook, we narrate our identity. We make our identity. And when we do so, that strengthens us, strengthens us to share and to cement relationships. And so what we eat, how we eat, has a direct impact on what kind of community we are. They, uh, they featured, can I point this? They featured my carne isada here, a soft tacos. And uh, they, they went with me to the valley and they traveled. And they talked a little bit about the history. And uh, everyone whom we interviewed said that they felt they were tied to this. Yo soy de esta tierra. Our people have been here for 15,000 years. And the connection between the land and the people could not be more different from the recent Tex-Mex phenomena, which is a nice restaurant food. I don't cut it down, but it is a restaurant food that does not come from our kitchens. It is not comida casera. What we're going to cook today is comida casera. Our food is before and beyond tex -Mex. The film talks a little bit about tex -Mex. We're going to be cooking enchiladas. Enchiladas are ancient up to this land because of the Chile 6,000 years ago. The artichoke 10,000 years ago was here. And when we say that the ingredients are of this land, we cook them in the way that our ancestors cooked them. So we are of this land. Esta es mi tierra. Yo soy de esta tierra. I'd like to just say a little bit about this food. This is the... Uh, map of 1824 of the Republic of Mexico. You take a closer look, and what we're talking about is the food of South Texas and Northeastern Mexico. Estás aquí. Aquí está Brownsville. Aquí está Matamores. Matamores. Yo voy a Matamoros. Can I speak? Who does not speak Spanish? Okay, I'll translate. So when I go to Matamoros, and I have a carne guisada taco. It's a Mexican taco. I walk a few miles and I have carne guisada. It's a it's the same taco. Our families are on both sides. We cook the same way, 
So I lived here, and I also lived here. We had land on both sides. I would travel from here to here, and I would have aguacates con sal y tortillas de maíz. And when I went to see my, my, my nieces, and I mean my cousins, we ate the same thing. So this is the Texas-Mexican region. It is an expression of the larger Mexican gastronomy. Everybody knows Oaxaca, Mexican mole, right? So, and no one has trouble saying this is Oaxaca Mexican food. This is Jalisco Mexican food, birria, pozole, Sinaloa Mexican food. They do chilorio, Sinaloa, and other. Ours is Texas Mexican. It is a regional expression of the Mexican gastronomy. There is not just one Mexican food. There are many Mexican foods. They are different. They differ depending on the region whether it's a coastal region or not. So how is it that our food, their food, Jalisco Mexican, Oaxaca Mexican, all are different but share similarities? We share chiles, we share chocolate, we share roasting, we share... And the reason is that our region was connected with Mesoamerica America for 10,000 years, 7,000 years, 5,000 years. This is a map that Cabeza de Vaca, the first Spaniard, he shipwrecked here. The Native Americans kept him alive, fed him. When he returned to Mexico, the head, the seat of government, he knew how to go back because the Native Americans told him these son caminos. And if you see the movie, Truly Texas Mexican, you'll see there were roads here, there were roads here, they were going in both directions. So this whole region was communicated. And so we shared recipes. And we shared cooking technologies, the molquete, for example. So that's why our food is similar. It's like another expression of Mexican food, la sal de rey. And, and our land has rich traditions that I want to celebrate. And that's why I'm cooking this way. La sal de rey in, Ma in Raymondville, who knows it? Okay, it's wonderful, isn't it? It's been there for thousands of years. Mesoamericans from Mexico City and South would travel to Raymondville, and they would pick up. We were going back and forth uh, in the region. And I want to point out three things that I like about this region. Even though it's one cohesive region, it does have variants. If you're around San Antonio, you cook one way. These are the names of our ancestors. They were written down by the... When you go to the Carancawa and to the uh, coastal, area, and that's Corpus Christi. These are some of the other names, Atacape, Carancawa. They may not be exactly correct because the Spaniards wrote them as they heard them. So they, you know, there's a variance. They may not be entirely correct, but we thank them that we have this. They don't exist just there. They exist in our communities because people today are claiming, yo soy Carancawa, yo soy como, como crudo, etc. It's in our... And this is the Rio Grande Valley. These are the Wawiltecan region. These are the names of some of the people. I wanted to put their names up because when I cook, I'm standing on their shoulders. Every, every technique, every ingredient I got, we get from them. They have invented these things. And our identity, I wanted to show this larger map because our identity is not just in the valley, but we grow here. The chiles, the rosal maritoques that we grow here, they have expanded and gone beyond. And so the identity is the community of the Americas. I always remember that. Vamos a cocinar con papitas. The papitas come from Peru. And they came to us. This is us. Estamos chiquitas aquí, you know, in the larger. But we have a tremendous contribution. And our identity is focused on the land. And the land is the America. Do you recognize that? This is in... Oh, Son Molcajetes in Escobar, it's near uh, uh, Rio Grande City. And uh, this is dated 10,000 years ago. So uh, that's the original Molcajete. You, you, you pound with, uh, with holes, and they used to pound tuna. They would mash tunas and make a drink out of it, and make purees just that we're doing. And I would say that is the great, great, great grandmother of this. We use this now, but it started there. That's 
That's this. Every, every thing, tool that we use was invented by our ancestors. So it's a connection always to people who, who were creative culinarians. Stone cook. When you bake, so this is pit, it's like our cabeza de pozo, right? That's what that is. And it's highly, highly developed. If you want fast cooking, you do a stone that's going to release heat. If you want long term cooking, you get a different stone because they want the stone to hold that heat and release it over hours. Stone boiling. I'm going to be boiling here. Uh, you, you take bark or uh, maybe uh, hide. You hide, you do a hole, and estas piedras se calientan in the fire. You put them in and it starts to boil. You have a beautiful stew. You can put your papitas, your, your other seasonings, and the chile that we're going to use today. Chile poblano, the birthplace of Capsicum anum, which is the biggest uh, group of chiles that we use, has origins. See where this is, where we are? Right here, this cave and this cave is a probable origin of these chiles. And look at how close we are to that. Archaeology and genetics. Also, look at how close the genetics, which means findings of genes that could be the chile. Look at how close they are to us. So we're very close to the origin domestication of chiles. They did linguistic studies where the words Chile and others appear, and we're still close with orange up here as well. I, I simply wanted to say that because as we start cooking now, we are cooking with ingredients that are ancient. Our people are ancient. And that's how I feel when I'm cooking it. I belong to this. I want to make beautiful things with what we have. This is the sunflower. We're going to cook with this. And let's start cooking. We have, if you get the light, this is a Jerusalem artichoke. It's, uh, it, it's, it's like a potato on the front. I mean, on the outside, I'm going to get a peeler. And we've already peeled some of this. So this is, I, I was hoping we could, I, I ordered a big bunch. I was going to give some away so you can grow them in your, put this and you get the, the sunflower. So what I do is, I peel it. The, uh, the skin is very nutritious, very flavorful. You don't need to peel, peel it. The reason I'm going to peel it a little bit today is for, is for look. But I put them in the enchiladas. I don't, I don't often peel them. But if you peel them, you know, you just go like that, you know, like potato, and it's fine. I don't peel them, so you don't need them. And then you, you slice them. And you do that just like potato. The first thing you do while slicing is you want to get a you want to get an edge, para que, para que no se resbale, you know. And then you slice about, about this side. Do you want me to hold it for the, for the virtual people to... And then you have... What I do is I make sticks. Like that, and then using the sticks, I cut them crosswise, and I make dice. So you have dice. So you want to do all of them like that. We're going to saute them. Do we have oil? Heating the oil on this, on this pan, please, while I do this. I chose Jerusalem artichoke because it's not common. Chile is common. Uh, the, the enchiladas are common. But this is not, and I hope it will be, because our people ate. This is our tradition. And I want, the more we know about our History and the more we, the panel was talking about delicious flavors. This is delicious. inherited but forgot. And the reason for God, we forgot is, is that we were driven from our lands. These used to be indigenous lands. And when the Spaniards came, not only did they take away that lake, that lake salt lake that used to be common property, and now it's called La Sal del Rey. Because when the Spaniards arrived, they said, this belongs to the king. We're claiming it all. And if you want salt, you have to pay. You have to pay the royal treasury to collect salt. So it completely changed the economic system uh, and, and was a big blow to the security of the area. And so by reclaiming foods, I think we can re reclaim the fact that we are of this 
And I think anybody who steps on this land, we should treat as brothers and sisters. Let's not conquer, let's not, let's not encounter one another the way we were encountered. When we were encountered, we were decimated, we were run out of our lands, killed. That's one way of encounter. I hope I don't... Estás bien. Te doy un... Do you need an apron? <laughs> if I splash you, here, put this on. <laughs> you never know. So let's put this farther back. Para... Okay, Can I have the others? So we're going to do two, two big little uh, camotes. This is a, a stainless steel and an induction burner, which is very, very nice because it touches and it heats up. You pick it up and it, there's no more. Could you uh, continue sauteing that, please? We're also going to do papas. And as I told you, papas come from Peru. And uh, we start this, uh, start sauteing those. And we'll, we'll saute together. If you saute the papas, I'll saute this. You have to do this for about 15 to 20 minutes. Sometimes I boil them. And boil them can be very, very nice as well. You have to taste. While these two are cooking, let me go to the chiles. We're going to cook these for 15 or 20 minutes. They're going to, they're going to be what we do um, with enchiladas. They're going to fill the enchiladas. I think it's a lovely, lovely taste that combines two ancient ingredients of, of, this, of this land. How do you do chile? Ah, what was that for? Oh, it was my water, my drinking water. They, they taught us in, uh, in, in, in school very many years ago. Um, don't have open containers of water when you're cooking. They have to have a cap on it. <laughs> you see why. ¿Quién sabe cocinar con chile? Who knows how to cook? All right. If I do something incorrect, let quietly. Okay. Uh, we're going to take a chile ancho, which is a chile poblano that has been ripened and dried. The way I like to do it is. I cut a slit along the side because it makes it, I mean, you could do it with your hands, you can use a scissor. And then we take the, we take the seeds out. All the seeds come out. El rabo se saca. Thank you. Isn't she great? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I also remove all of the veins, the white veins, because that's where the capsaicin resides, and that's what burns your tongue. Without that, then you, you don't have heat. This is one of the, one of the main differences with, uh, with uh, Tex-Mex cooking. That, thank you. So we're, do, we're going to do uh, the ancho, which is very common in moles. It, it's a beautiful, rounded flavor. And chile pasilla. Chile pasilla tastes a little bit like raisin. Uh, one of the big differences between Tex-Mex and this is Tex-Mex uses phrases like three-alarm chili, two-alarm chili, with an emphasis on the macho emphasis on hot, you know, how much heat can I eat? And they even have the scale, Scoville scale, of how many, how high the scale goes for the intensity. We don't do that. Uh, we, we use, I tell the students, when you have a restaurant and the vendor comes to you and says, get this chile, this is 10,000 Scoville scale, this is 3,000 Scoville scale, you don't want that vendor. You need to be talking not about heat, although heat is essential, we use it. But the main thing is you need to be talking about aroma, about flavor, about color. And so when we blend, when we blend the various chiles together, that's how you create the special sauce that you want. And today, we're going to blend uh, chiles guajillo, no, chile pasilla con chile, con chile ancho. These are the, you have to rehydrate them after you take the seeds out. Eh, lo voy a hacer con las manos, con los dedos. This is the chile ancho. Let me get a big one that has been rehydrated. See, this is it. This is the chile ancho. 
I want to show you the Chile, the Chile Poblano. This is Chile Poblano. Lo secas, you, you dry it, and it becomes this. So it's rehydrated. See the same thing. Except, thank you very much. So we put those chiles in there, and you know that these have an ancient, ancient roots of domestication in our in our territory, in our region. So we put all of the. We don't have tongs today. Yo me lavé las manos. <laughs> Ahí está. That's, that's the chile ancho, and then I'm going to put the chile asia. Turn it a little bit red. That's our base. That's our base, and we're going to add the seasoning. And a little bit of water. I normally don't use this water. I think, I think these are, are not uh, so commercially grown that they have a lot of pesticides. So I'm going to use the water. Normally, I would use clean water. My mother always used the same water because it's so flavorful. But today, we have so much pollution that we have to be very careful. I'm going to put in here the three Texas Mexican Trinity of, 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 of spices. Quien sabe que es? What are the three spices that we put in arroz con pollo, the fusari? ¿Qué son? Ahí está, comino. Bueno, y la sal, ajo y pimienta. Y le voy a poner la sal. So you see, I give it the Texas Mexican because the others, Chilas, will not have that flavor blend. It's our own flavor blend. Only this region uses that special uh, uh, flavor. And then I'm going to use uh, oregano. Le voy a poner oregano para más sabor. This is European oregano. I like to use Mexican oregano. There are two Mexican oregano. And uh, one is Texas Mexican. It grows only in Nuevo Leon, Coahuila, Texas, and a little bit southwest. And the scientific name is Poliamenta longiflora. And the other Mexican, uh, Mexican uh, cilantro, which you buy in the grocery store, is Lipia, Lipia graviolis. <laughs> and most people know Mexican uh, oregano from that because uh, it's Mexican, it comes from central Mexico, and that's the one that is sold in the store. My sister grew this, my mother grew this, and you can find it. Uh, I think they call it. I don't know what the common name is for, for when they sell it in the nursery, but I suggest that you, when you, if you go through this, if you find that it's interesting, go to my website. I'm going to post pictures of all three, and if you find them, and I'll I'll put the picture of the nursery, of the name that you would use in a nursery. And uh, taste the difference. The three of them are very different. I, I use the Texas Mexican oregano because it's brighter to me. Okay. Uh, I'll have to talk over that. ¿Cómo está saliendo? Bueno, that looks very nice. Okay. We'll put this in here next. This used to be done. This used to be done. This used to be done in a metate. And, and what they do in a metate is get a very, very fine puree. So when you have the first bite, parece que se enojó. ¿Qué quieres? Le voy a poner más agua. Eh, se nos acabó el agua. I have this. Sorry to turn my back on you, but oh, there. The reason I'm doing this so fast is when you do the metate, it becomes very, very fine. When you put that enchilada in your in your palate, you want to pay attention to the mouth feel. You don't want any granules. You don't want any grains. There. You want it to be very, very smooth. You want to have a smooth texture. For an enchilada, here, thank you, technology. And more oil, do we have more oil? Oil? No more oil. Okay. 
Normally I would put some oil. We want to cook this a little bit for four or five minutes because the flavors are a little bit green. The chiles are green. And if you, we call it a frying the chile, friendo el chile. This is an important step. So the flavors all come together, but mainly you lose the green flavor of the chile. Once this uh, cooks, it deepens in color. It's a, it's a bright, ¿sabes qué? Mira. See this color? See, it's a bright red. It, it's, it's bright, bright red. It's going to get, it's going to be very, very deep. But this is the color now, and this is the texture. Notice how there are no lumps. There are no lumps on the... It's very, very smooth. It's very important that you have... Some people put it on a fine mesh sieve through a strainer to make sure that there are no seeds. See, it's very, very smooth. See? I see. And, and see the smell and the color of what it is. It's a lovely smell, you know, when you... So as, as we cook it, the aroma is going to get even more intense. Did I drop something? No. So the aroma is going to get more intense. Let's cook this down, please. And while we cook it down, we'll get ready to make the enchilada. Okay. Mira, mientras. We're going to cook this for three minutes, three minutes or so. We have, and, and the flavor will change. You'll see the, the flavor. Uh, I want to go very, very quickly. Can we do the lights again? Can you turn off the lights again? The three regions are very, very distinct. And I love to talk about Texas Mexican food because this is where I belong. A lot of people like to talk about Oaxaca or, or, or Nuevo Leon, I mean, um, Guanajuato and so forth. I think our food is so rich and it has yet to be discovered more, more richly by, by many of the, by the consumers. But I'll tell you this, restaurants in, in McAllen, in Brownsville, all over the valley in San Antonio, los restaurantes de comida casera, they're cooking this. They, it's just instinct done. Uh, this is what the central area. Lots of fish. That's uh, catfish, carp, pecans, of course, you know, we had deer. I'm going to go very, very fast. And here you've got mussels, river water mussels. So our, our ancestors ate all of these things and also snails. So you probably, we know they ate snails because if it were a colony of snails, they would have older snails, middle snails, baby snails. This was a colony of all adults. So they, they were shells that were thrown away after they had been eaten. Sotol. I love to cook sotol. We'll have to do sotol next. You cook it. People drink it now, you know. And on the seaside, you very well know Corpus Christi. Of course, you're from here. The Karankawas are very important people there. And if you know anything about fishing, you know we have conch soup. I, all of these things are, are beautiful uh, foods that used to feed our community and still do in many ways. Uh, I really wanted to show the duck because uh, chefs in fine dining are saying, oh, doctor, our people have been eating duck centuries, millennia, and enjoying them. And for this region, which is the South Texas and the Coahuiltecan region, uh, of course, you have the rivers. Fish is very important. And uh, turtles. Do we have a turtle? Yes. Turtle soup. And what do we, oh, agarita. You know agarita, the agarita bush. Turkey, of course. And uh, I think we have, oh, uh, yes. Rattlesnake, although I don't serve it too much when I do my dinner parties because they, they this is lovely. Oh, what is it? It's, got, it's, it's rattlesnake. Oh, <laughs> they don't like it anymore. But it's tasty. They say it tastes like chicken. I think that's because it probably ate the chicken. <laughs> and of course, uh, nopalito. So we're going to, oh, good, it's done. Mira, I'm going to, oh, that's so good. I'm not going to show it to you, although I want to. Now you see the, no, I will. <laughs> I will. No, that's otro, otro. Because, I mean, and get the smell. I'll, I'm going to do it really fast. hope I don't have an accident. 
Mira, I'm just going to waft it around. See that? That's why you cook it. You have to cook it. If you don't cook it, it's not, it's not ready. It's like mole. It, it, yes, that's, that, that's what mole would be like. But mole has more ingredients. See, you waft it. Mole has more ingredients uh, than this, although it is the basic recipe and technique that I showed. And that technique, as you, you know, with a metate, is thousands of years old. And we have women to thank for it. That's another, that's another thing that, oh, that's another thing. Here, smell it. That's all right. That's another thing the history books don't tell you. These technologies, these flavor profiles, the technologies were invented by women, engineered by women, and the flavor profiles were created by women. Cooking was a women's and two-spirit people. OK, so now we're ready to add. The thickener. Estas van a ser las enchiladas. Uh, so about eight cups of uh, water and uh, uh, okay. and uh, you have to dissolve it before you put it in. My mother used to do that. Who who does enchilada sauce like? Flour. The chef. Okay, good. I I would urge you to do this. My mother. This is the way my mom would do them, with a queso fresco, which we will use. It's a little bit lumpy, but we'll still. Lo prende. And this is going to thicken. You know what? Put it really high. It's going to bubble a lot, so if you'll control it. If it bubbles too much, would you turn it? Okay. We'll get ready for the enchiladas. To do the enchiladas, I like to use a skillet. So we'll get one of the skillets that we had before. So that you can dip the enchiladas in this. This is going to boil down to half. Uh, I'm not going to let it boil down. I'm just going to show you what it might look like of our time, but you'll be able to taste because Chef Nadia Casa Peralta with her students cooked earlier and they've, they've, they've made it. Let's what I do is I take this. We have a ladle, no ladle. This is a very large ladle. <laughs> I don't recommend you do this at home. We want to cook it down and it will thicken. You'll taste it. Thank you. And the reason I like the reason that I like to uh, do the tortillas this way, you'll notice that I do not use normally in restaurants they, they take this, they put it through some oil, and then they wrap them and then they put the sauce. Uh, I don't think that's an enchilada. Uh, enchilada is for the past participle of the verb enchilar. Yo me enchilé. Enchilaste. Uh, chilified. This is chilified. It's enchilado. So if you take a tortilla, what I'm going to do once it's cooked down, I'm going to dip it into the, into the sauce, into the chile, and the chile will infuse the tortilla completely. So this becomes a tortilla enchilada. It doesn't matter what you fill it with or what not. You can eat it exactly the way that you can have it after you dip it, and it's an enchilada. The focus of the enchilada is the chile. Which choice of chiles did you use? Which spices did you add? How did you cook it so that the flavors developed? That's an enchilada. That's a real enchilada. Not what you, what you fill it with enhances. So cheese can enhance it. Chicken can enhance it. I, Oftentimes, just eat this as an enchilada. It's una tortilla enchilada. You put it on a plate and you, you eat it. You can have a dry enchilada. I sometimes take the masa, you know, that you make. And in the masa, instead of using water, I use water like this that has been liquefied with chiles. And so when the, this comes out, it's, it's red. So you have a dry enchilada. It's una tortilla enchilada. It's already dried. So that's the, 
I think that's what you're going to taste when the, when the service is done. Let me start plating it. But before I start plating it, let me finish by saying, can we have the lights? I'm sorry to do this with the lights, but I think you can see more clearly if we turn them off. I like to make the connection of native ingredients with the immigrant European imported ingredients that we got after, after colonizing. You see this Three Sisters? Do you know what Three Sisters is? Three, some, some. Okay. Then some don't. Mira, eh, calabacita, corn, and uh, frijol. These three seeds have different, have different sensitivities to warmth and to the sun. So the sensitivity that comes first is the corn. You put, you put the seeds all in at the same time. The corn comes up first, grows really high. The beans, no, the beans come out second because then they have something to grow on. They curl around this and they come up here. Once these two are, are, are grown, then the uh, la calabacita sprouts. It says, now it's my time, and it covers this entire area so that weeds will not develop. It's a beautiful, organic, harmonious way to garden. And this is our tradition. This is, the, this is what most farming looked like. And uh, when the European ingredients arrived, we had, to, we had to contend with no longer having access to the things we, we knew, because our land had been taken. So we had to create beautiful food out of necessity, out of want. And we did. We had onions that are native, but garlic is, in, garlic is new. And so the beauty of our comida casera is once we had no longer corn, totol, beans, tomatoes, we, ha we had wheat, milk, onion, and lard, and we incorporated them according to our palate. It's a Native American palate using indigenous techniques. We could no longer access deer, turkey, buffalo, quail. Our lands had been taken away. We were, us, we were marginated. So we had to cook with cows, pigs, sheep, and goats. And we made beautiful food out of that. And that's, this, is the, this is the beautiful food that we celebrate at this summit. So we end up with indigenous native ingredients with those that are imported. And it all comes down to food contains all of our ancestral memory. Food forms our identity. We narrate it once we make it. And then finally, it gives us a strength because we all share it to form a community. We want to build a table where all are welcome. That's the real sense of the new encounter. Can we have the lights on again? The new encounter, which is not an encounter of subjugation, it's a, it's a They turned off our heat. You see how I did that? You, you, you submerge it. It's about eight, eight seconds to 10 seconds. If you put it in too long, it will be, uh, it'll be mush. And if you don't put it long enough, then it won't infuse. Then I'm going to take the papitas. I'm going to use my fingers because you're not eating this version. No, that's the papitas and then the artichoke. The artichoke. I don't like to put too much because I want the, the emphasis to remain on the chile and the enchilada, tortilla enchilada. You roll it. Looks beautiful. I'm going to make another one. We'll do three. You always do three. One is very, very lonely. Two is it's there. It's not dynamic. But three, I, but three is a nice dynamic number. And uh, I thought about doing this uh, combination of papitas con artichoke hearts because when I was growing up, we had enchiladas de papitas. Did you all? Yes, you did. We had papitas. And, and people, some chefs from Mexico say, why are you doing that? It's because it's in our tradition. That's what we did. And I thought, well, if we're going to recover the recent memory, of uh, papitas, let's go farther, 6,000 years down, and recover el camote de, 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 de la girasol. 
And, and I, hope, I hope that you will find Camotes de Girasol to plant, you know, and try it. Or if not, get it online. It really is highly nutritious, and it's delicious. I think this combination of flavors together with a salsa, no tenemos, no tenemos, eh, no, no tenemos eh, algún tenedor. So I'm going to do this. And here's the final cut. Your, your, your uh, sauce is going to be very thick, much thicker than this. But I urge you, take a, a spoon, a ladle, and put plenty, plenty of uh, sauce on it. Because keep in mind, the star of this son los chiles. What you did, all the trouble you went to, to make this beautiful, beautiful chile. Lo demás es lo de menos. It's there, it's, you need it. And so I'm going to show you on this plate how much salsa I put. It should be thicker. You don't have time to thicken it. And I'll leave it here so that you can see how much sauce is in there. Queremos probar el chile. El chile with, with, and get a good tortilla with a lovely corn. You need to taste the corn of the tortilla. So what you have here is you have a complex of flavors, each of which is very delicious. They're coming together. So you want to do it slowly and, and, and have your palate. Uh, we need to have your palate taste, taste the varies. Le voy a poner un poquito de queso fresco because it's very tart. And some diced, is this the diced? And some diced onion. Okay. I don't think we have time for questions or all. So this, I don't know if you can see it. Well, I'll, I'll come down. This, this, this is this is the enchiladas, enchiladas de. So here, aquí las tienes, ¿sí? Hey, you want to take a picture? Yes. Fine. Here we go. Here we go. You see, it's, look at how much how much chile. No es lo que tiene adentro. Lo que tiene adentro es importante, pero también it's the sauce. ¿Qué quieres? There. There we go, and I'll pass it here, and I will say. Which is one more picture, okay? But notice when you serve it, ponle bastante chile. Eh? Okay. Muchas gracias. Hello, okay. So here's the best part. You guys will taste it here in just a second. We wanted to make sure that the cooking demo was accompanied by a real interactive experience. You know, before, so this is the, this is the culmination of our food summit. And we want to celebrate with everyone here in the audience. We want to celebrate with Adan and all the wealth of knowledge that he's brought. But before we let you uh, off, uh, uh, just two things. First of all, I wanted to thank everybody for your participation. In, in this food summit. I think for if you guys were able to see uh, any of the other panels, you'll <coughs> realize that we covered a whole range of topics. And you know we were, I think, able to successfully blend all of the beautiful aspects of uh, food here in the Rio Grande Valley, and, and then also be able to understand what our assets are so that we can start to address some of the issues that we have in the Rio Grande Valley. This food summit was brought to you by the generous support of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, uh, who contributed uh, to support not just the food summit, but also the series of meetings that we've had since last year to really identify what these topics were. So thank you again to our sponsors. Uh, we also wanted to thank, in particular, uh, a few uh, very important contributors. The first of which is the Office for Sustainability, um, Marianella Franklin, uh, who leads that office. Her team was so instrumental in making sure that we had a great venue in which to um, in which to host this, um, as well as you know advertising and organizing. We started meeting back in December, and believe it or not. We couldn't find a great spot until the, her office really cornered a good spot for us to celebrate together. Um, 
And so thank you, Marianella, for uh, Jeremy and, 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 and Jacqueline uh, for all of your help. Um, I also wanted to thank the Institute for Ecology, Scholarship, and Health. You see a lot of very young faces that have been ushering and quiet behind the scenes. And that team of four um, just did a tremendous job. Bella, Luz, Mackenzie, and of course, Hernan, who directs the Institute of Ecology, Scholarship, and Health. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. And, and, I, and then, then finally, I just like to you know thank our advisory um, council. Uh, of the, you know, you really are the brainchild behind the food summit. Some of you guys are here. Some of I know you guys are watching. Um, the advisory committee uh, com is composed of farmers, the uh, composed of business folks, chefs, uh, scholars, um, uh, community members each of who have brought a very unique voice to this participatory process. Um, you know, you guys helped identify the speakers, you guys helped decide the themes. And honestly, I, I can't say that we, I had any idea of how um, just important the intersection of all these themes are with culture, with community, with action, with policy, with, um, you know, human rights. I mean, Obviously, as, 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 as Jim Hightower said earlier, all of this is just so connected, right? We're not just talking about food, but we're talking about a system. And whether or not we, um, you know, and how do we reimagine a new system where everyone um, benefits from the prosperity of food and agriculture here in the Rio Grande Valley? That's what these conversations were really about, right? And so we don't expect, um, you know, we, we, don't, we don't want you to stop these conversations here. Right? And the, the goal here is to bring folks together, to celebrate over food, to celebrate over um, you know, uh, camaraderie and, and compassion. And so we want, we want to encourage you guys to continue those connections. If you guys have any other ideas or you want to contribute to our advisory council, our door is wide open. And so we meet every month. Um, you know, we sometimes meet in person. We sometimes meet online. And so if you really wanted to contribute to that, um, please reach out to myself or Hernan. We'll make sure that we put you on that list. Okay, so thanks once again. Um, I, I, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so yeah. One other thing. Um, you know, you uh, you probably haven't noticed, but there's a lot of other folks walking around helping you with the name tags. We wanted to also acknowledge our volunteers. We had a group of uh, young volunteers who just stepped in and said, "Yes, of course, I, I would love to help participate." So. I don't know um, all of them by name, but you know who you are. I think, and you know what? Like, if you're a volunteer here, can you just like raise your hand or stand up? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So much, um, you know. And 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 I and I've seen you throughout the day uh, yesterday as well. Um, and you know, we want to just acknowledge you know you taking the important time out of your day. We have a, a group of volunteers, however, we want to particularly highlight. So, in fact, Nadia, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask you just tell a little bit about the students who volunteered to help uh, prepare some of the food for the mixer. I'm going to hand this to you really quick, and then you could tell us a little bit about what the culinary experience is going to be. Hey, everybody. So, uh, today's food was made by uh, my chef, 1491, 41. Sorry, I forget it all the time. Um, 41 American Regional Cuisine class. And so in this, we cover not only, right, America's food, so you have like New England clam chowder, enchiladas from Texas, right, the very stereotypical ones. But we also cover indigenous cuisines. Um, I also teach the sous chef, which is um, Sherman, uh, Chef Sherman's book. And uh, this recipe, we were, were supposed to be in Texas next week. So the native recipe is Chef Adan's um, enchilada recipe. They made it for you all to enjoy. And um, yeah, I, I, I want to highlight the students because they're the ones that we're passing the baton to. Um, the young people in the audience are the ones that we're passing on the baton to. So um, I'm incredibly proud. And you will too once you taste the enchiladas. And just a quick note, Chef, yesterday, um, one, they were like, what is this potato-like substance, right? <laughs> I, this is the fun part for me. They're like, what is this? And I'm like, oh, my God, here we go. We're going to talk about it. 
has nothing to do with Jerusalem. They're like, why they name it that, right? <laughs> so incredible questions they ask. Why they name it that? Um, and then also one of the uh, students said, why is this sauce so red? It's so red. Like enchilada sauce isn't this red because they have eaten enchiladas a lot, but have never made it from dehydrating the chiles, blending the chiles. And then came my favorite part, which was them saying, well, my grandma's has cinnamon. Well, my grandma's has like more onion. And that's, uh, again, tying to your memory, identity, and, and culture. So enjoy it for you guys. And um, yeah, thank you so much for inviting us. So we, we have one last request. If you're going to eat an enchilada, you have to do the survey. So um, uh, we have a QR code here. Uh, you know, you might already know how this works, but if you have a cell phone uh, that does the pictures, kind of take a picture of that, it kind of pops up. And it's just a very, very short survey. And the why we want the survey is because we want to do this again. Right? And I think we want to organize one where we can continue these conversations. Your opinion matters. We want to make this as participatory as possible. For those who know my work, um, even as, a, as an agronomist, somebody who does research, we try to do it in the, in the most participatory way. And that is the goal of the Food Summit, to include everyone's voice and, 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 and uplift those voices so that we can kind of be in concert at one point or another. So the, the goal here, and I have already said this to some of you guys, the goal of the Food Summit is to collect these stories, these identities, these opinions, these worldviews, and find where we all share some of the same goals. You heard it today with the chefs and the, and the, and the farmers. We all, all want to head in the same direction, and that's the same direction we want to head with our farm workers, uh, with, our, with our businesses, with our entrepreneurs, with our policymakers. And so once we can collect those shared visions and ideas, we would like to author and invite your participation in putting together what we call a food charter. And what that is, is it's a set of principles and to help as guidelines so that whenever you are trying to think of a business or trying to become a chef or trying to start a farm or trying to do a farm-related business, is that we can point to this set of guidelines for you to do it in a way that is as, as, um, as inclusive, as many voices as possible. Right? So you're thinking about your farm worker. You're thinking about your farmer. You're thinking about your, um, your students, your entrepreneurs, when you're drafting a policy. And this set of guidelines is going to be shared among all of us. So that's the goal here. We're going to continue this conversation next year, I promise. Um, you know, but it's, it all starts really with you. And thank you once again for participating in this year's Food Summit. I think, I think we're ready, right? All right, thank you, you guys. See ya.